Interactive Brokers Daily Lineup, and we're also going to check out the new Bureau of Econom Economic Analysis report and Federal H-8 report that was released on Friday, August 20th. Uh, this is, again, more interesting data here. You know, as you can see here, the S&P, NASDAQ, and Dow rate rose ever so slightly. Uh, however, there was some interesting movement in the sectors here. Uh, keep track in this here we're looking at uh you know vanguard rose up as well as certain things as uh, the nasdaq the russell 1000 which was fine uh, however we had some interesting news down here the 10-year yield uh for the treasury uh, increased to 1.26 which is almost nothing about two tenths of a percent while the two-year was unchanged at 0.21 0 0.21 uh, the u.s dollar index decreased by one tenth as well so that's not looking good for the dollar, as well as uh, crude futures for oil. Crude futures dropped 2.3%. You know, uh, futures contracts as well have declined 9% this week. So as well as existing home sales for July and the preliminary market for August on Monday are looking kind of interesting as well. Uh, up so far year to date, we're still looking at some, pers some positives on these, which is a good thing. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't know if that's going to last much longer. Just kind of based on this data over here. Well, we can launch the event calendar here real quick and see what we can pull up. There's some really interesting information here as well that you can always take a look at. Consumer confidence in the UK is down ever so slightly. As well as a few other things, the uh, consumer price index in Japan did decrease, which is good for them, uh, but it's not looking so great for us over here and a lot of other places. For example, there was a, uh, Less economic growth in, in Norway and, and than expected. There was also uh, United Kingdom borrowing rates uh, is, is, are down. The percentages of retail sales, the United Kingdom uh, missed by three to four percent, as well as Malaysia. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not Malaysia. That's United Kingdom for fuel retail sales, as well as uh, construction in Poland and retail sales in Taiwan. I'm sorry, looks like Peru's. Uh, GDP is down about 4% as well. So there's some interesting changes happening here. Let's move on here real quick. We'll just get straight to some of these reports. Looking at the May report from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, we can see where our gross domestic product came for the almost the entire GDP here uh, in the quarter three of 2020 came from personal consumption expenditures the increases of stimulus that was sent out to people that was spent on goods, such as durable goods and non-durable goods. Durable goods are cars, auto parts. That was our main spending point. And non-durable goods, 4.35% uh, of the GDP, was uh, actually takeout and food for off-premises consumption, which is pretty absurd. You know, and services, that's transportation services, Uber, Lyft, things like that. You know, uh, as well as if you look at now in, in quarter one of 2021, we actually had a decrease on these things in quarter four, even though there were still stimuluses. Uh, and in quarter one, we had further stimulus. And we, we are not looking good. We're not looking good. The change in private inventories is down. Our private domestic investment, export of goods and services has been down quarter after quarter, three quarters in a row. Well, look, government consumption expenditures and gross investment. So the government is, spent, is uh, spending more on national defense and was spending a little bit less on non-defense, which is COVID. And again, that's ramping back up here in the first quarter. And it's going to do so even more here with Delta variant that is starting to get out of control in certain places. Motor vehicle output, as you can see, was down quarter over quarter. What does that mean? These companies just can't make enough cars. There's a global chip shortage. There's a motor vehicle shortage. Uh, and the majority here, as you can see, 6.42% of our GDP, not including motor vehicle output, is pretty high. You know, and the final sales is 9.03. So it, it does contribute a, a good amount. 
let's go uh, move on down the chart here. Here's a gross domestic purchases. You know, what we had up here was the real gross domestic product. Okay. Supposedly the real one, but it's really all COVID spending and government PPP and uh, stimulus. That's the all, all, of, all of it right there. We reviewed it on the last video, so I won't review it too much. If you haven't seen yesterday, uh, the video from two days ago regarding uh, the top four banks owing about 169, <clears throat> excuse me, $169 trillion. Uh, you should take a look at that first. Now, now you can take a look at this as well. Personal income as well. Decreases in personal dividends income, you know. Unemployment insurance increased because more people are out of work. Primarily reflecting, reflecting increases in economic impact payments and in pandemic unemployment compensation payments. So government social benefits is pretty much the majority of our GDP. As you can see here from the BIA report, personal current taxes increased by $36 billion in the first quarter. And on top of that, they increased $51 billion almost in the fourth quarter of 2020. So that's a huge increase in the amount of taxes that the American people, such as ourselves, are paying here. Uh, disposable personal income increased in the first quarter after decreasing in the fourth quarter. Because in the fourth quarter, there was less stimulus than there was in the first quarter, of course. But personal outlays, which means expenses, has increased by $492 billion in the first quarter of 2021 after increasing $125 billion in the fourth quarter of 2020. And in the second quarter of this year, they increased another $580 billion. So we're seeing quarter over quarter increases in American expenses. Fourth quarter 2020, 125. First quarter 21 was 492 billion. And this quarter two of 2021 was 580 billion. We're getting to some ridiculous hyperinflation over here. Personal savings rate was down 21%, and then uh, which was uh, 13% previously as well. You know what, actually, I'm sorry, that was incorrect. They're, they're playing with the words here. Watch this. Go to personal savings rate that we've previously extrapolated from the more recent report from the quarterly report on banking and trading derivatives, as well as the Federal Reserve Systems H8 liabilities. In the second quarter, personal savings was 1.97 trillion. However, in the first quarter, that was 4.07 trillion. So personal savings by Americans as well as the personal savings rate, Americans have lost over $2 trillion from our bank accounts. That's more than half. We had 4.07, we lost over two, and we have 1.97 collectively as a nation or as people of this country. You know, that, that, that's really bad. Losing half of all the money that we have, either spending it on rent and essentials or non-essentials like, you know, car parts and takeout. So a lot of information here that I wanted to cover with you guys, you know, credit default swaps we discussed are over 5,000% when you take into account banks and holding companies, which are basically shell companies, literally shell, cor shell corporations, as well as, uh, you know, the top four banks owing $168 trillion. And SIBO has admitted that inflation in the GDP will surpass its maximum sustainable levels by the end of the year. Okay. Now, truly, this just began as an investigation of the correlations between 08, 11, 13, and what was currently happening in the 2021 stock market crash, uh, stock market compared to the crashes and the debt ceiling issues that we had back in those issues in at those times, 2008, 11, 13. And honestly, it just turned into my biggest nightmare. And uh, there's no good outcome here. So as of uh, August 1st, we're entering a completely new debt ceiling crisis here. Uh, Congress has been on a six week vacation. They don't come back till September 20th. When you combine that with an expired rent moratorium where 6.2 million people are facing evictions, uh, we're in pretty rough shape, okay? 6.2 million people are unable to work because their employer closed or lost business due to the pandemic in the June 2021 report by the U.S. Bureau of Labor. In June of 2021, 6.2 million people did not work at all or worked less hours because their employer closed or lost business because of coronavirus. And aside from that, that was 7.9 million people in May of 2021 and 49 million in 2020. So here we're looking at 6.2 million people that did not work at all or worked fewer hours in the last four weeks because their employer closed or lost business, period. The majority of these people, as you can see, are 25 to 54 year olds, vast majority of the workforce right now. And they're the ones that are out of work for the most part.
This is for people that are t uh, 55 and over. And this is for 16 to 24 year olds, you know, a lot of young high school kids and kids in college and, and people just trying to start start their way in life. So there are some pretty nasty statistics out here that we've got to deal with. The homeowners that own these places, these, these homes, and their tenants are not able to pay or have not given them rent money and are not going to be kicked out anytime soon, uh, they're going to lose their homes. And when that does happen, when the bank takes it back, then those people that are living in those homes are going to be removed. They're going to be forcibly removed and evicted, regardless of the current eviction moratorium. The eviction moratorium that we're looking at now is... is it's illegal, it's unconstitutional, and Biden has forced the CDC to literally extend this moratorium. That is not legal. But by the time that this is over, any lawsuits or anything that might come from it, it's gonna have an economic impact that any lawsuit is not gonna change. Because these tenants don't realize that when they get kicked out of, their, out of this home, they're gonna have bad credit already because they haven't paid their landlord rent. Because only 6% of the money that was allocated from the federal government for this eviction moratorium, quantitative easing for the rent to tenants, only 6% out of this $90 billion has actually been distributed. However, the entire 100% is going towards the GDP that they are claiming for 2021. This is a downright lie. So they're claiming 100% of this money, but have only passed out 6%. So is our GDP truly what they say it is? Of course not just from that one fact alone, okay? Without taking this into account, SIBO is projecting a federal deficit of $3 trillion this year as the economic disruption caused by, by pandemic uh, and legislation enacted in response continue to boost the deficit, okay? Now, in August 2011, there was a debt ceiling crisis and SIBO projected that the federal budget would show a deficit at that time of $1.5 trillion. Now, that was 9.8%. Now, we're looking at 13.4% of the gross domestic product. And that would be the second largest since 1945. And that was, uh, it's pretty crazy. Exceeded only by the 14.9 shortfall, of course, in 2020. And for the period of economic expansion from the second quarter of 09 through the 19, real GDP increased at 2.3%. That's pretty paltry but at least it's something. And now we're looking at nothing but artificial gains because then they have the second quarter of 2020 through the first quarter of 2021. It increased at an annual rate of 14.1%. It's all fake GDP on money that hasn't been distributed for things like the eviction moratorium. The government can't pay its bills anyways because uh, the US Treasury and Janet Yellen are running out of money and have to use extraordinary measures in order to pay what they can. And all of this is related to the excessive amount of money that was printed. 33% of money that was been printed in the history of the world was printed in 2020 by the Federal Reserve of the United States of America. This is completely artificial. SIBO estimates from 2011 would be heaven compared to what we're looking at right now. Okay? They claim that the three-month Treasury bill would be 4.4%. It return not bad for three months, but in, reality, in actuality, we're looking at 0.01% to 0.06%. Wow. Our treasury bills are complete garbage. And as we showed in the last video, the curve up and down just shows us how bad it is. It's going to, the derivatives are going to come crashing down and these T bills are going to be falling into the negative range very shortly. Again, their 2011 projections estimated the treasury bill would be worth 5.4%. What is it actually? 1.24%. That's really bad. Check it out. This is the year over year forecast from SIBO. Excuse me, let's close that out. This was their forecast back in 2011 for the fiscal years of 2011 to 2021. They made projections. And as you can see here, maybe you won't be able to see that, so I'll slide that down a little bit beneath the video. But as you can see here in 2021, they were estimating that the three-month treasury bill would be worth 4.4%. We know that it's in the 0.05% right now. You know, they estimated that the price index would be, that uh, inflation would be around 2.0%. And it's currently around 54 to 6.4%. Let's move on. Basically, my point on that is their forecasts 
are always, always wrong. They always claim that inflation is going to be better than it is. They claim that the unemployment rate is going to be better than it is. They claim that the treasury notes are going to be worth more than they really are. Salaries and wages are going to be going up, but that's not the case. That's not the case. And this is a, this is a joke. Oh, this is part two of seven here. There was a report released by uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis uh, on the GDP for the second quarter of 2021, which is uh, one of the ones that we were just looking at here as well. But the second quarter report states the current personal current dollar personal income decreased 1.32 trillion after ha having increased previously. But that was all fake stimulus gains. Disposable personal de income decreased 1.4 trillion or 26.1 percent in the second quarter, in contrast to an increase prior to that more fake gains, real disposable personal income. I don't have any disposable income. I don't know about you, but I need all my income. That decreased 30% in quarter two of 2021, and it's going to decrease even more in quarter three. That decreased by over 890 billion for us as Americans. Personal expenses increased 680. I'm sorry, I might've said 580 previously. But this is the newest report, so it was, anal it was uh, updated. This one, previous one that we were just looking at, my apology. This one here is looking for the second quarter. Okay. There it is. Sorry about that. There's the, the correct figure. I might have been looking at real GDP, and this is current dollar GDP. I apologize if I misspoke a little bit earlier in the video. But it increased. Personal expenses for Americans increased $680 billion in quarter two. What does that mean? I have to pay, you have to pay, every adult watching this that lives in the United States has to pay $717 a month more to have the same exact lifestyle now than you did three months ago. So three months ago, your life was $717 a month cheaper on average, all of us that are, that are listening and talking right now. That's a lot. So our expenses have increased $150 billion, mostly based on inflation. Personal savings was down $2 trillion. The personal saving rate was down 10% in the second quarter and down 20% in the first quarter. So that's 31% right there, 32. And inflation, oh, that's, that's steadily moving up. Unlike everything else in America, the price index for purchases increased 5.7% in the second quarter. And it had already increased 3.9% in the first quarter. The PCE price index, what we pay at the grocery stores and things like that increased 6.4%. That's, that's insane compared with 3.8% in the first quarter. And what did they tell us that it was going to be? Oh, well, let's take one more look at that. What was the PCE supposed to be? 2.3%. 2.3 and 2.2. Does that look like 2.3% to you? Because I think it's triple. Just some rough maths, you know? You don't have to be a genius. You just have to use common sense and read what they're actually putting out there. Because this stuff is out of hand. The acceleration in GDP real growth reflects nothing but artificial economic strength, in my opinion. Nothing. Okay, now this is directly from this report, these reports here. The GDP is primarily based in the continued economic recovery from COVID-19 in the form of government assistance payments distributed to households and businesses. And what else, what was the second biggest contributing factor? An acceleration in consumer spending and upturns in federal, state, and local government spending more than accounted for the acceleration in real GDP. So they're telling us right here that it's all fake stimmy gains. Says it right there, clear as day. These were partly offset, which means the GDP was brought down uh, realistically the first half is artificial based on printed money, but it was actually brought down even more so by downturns in private inventory investment because nobody's buying real estate, uh, single family homes right now, except for BlackRock and other large corporations because Americans don't have the savings or the credit to do so. Half of them haven't paid their rent. How are they going to qualify to buy a home? A lot of them are unemployed. Unemployment rates are through the roof, regardless of what they try to tell us that they're not. Place, uh, nine states have an unemployment rate of almost 8%. Nine states. Just do a little quick math. Hey, that's about almost 20% of the country. Let's move on. Via, again, 
likes to say, an upturn in spending on goods and an acceleration in spending on services is what, what contributed to the, the GDP. And what does that mean? We spent a lot of money on used automobiles that increased 47% in, in, because of inflation and auto parts. So we got some nice wheels and sound systems for our cars. Great. And then we spent the rest of it on food and beverages purchased for off services, off premises consumption. Fucking takeout. Seen a lot of Starbucks lately. I know. That's not going to stop anytime soon. But I can guarantee you what, you're going to see a lot less Bank of America's on the on the corners than you currently are. Within services, the leading contributors were upturns in spending on food and accommodation on transportation services. It means people are spending the majority of their money on Uber and Lyft. Because Uber and Lyft have undercut the, the taxi cabs and the medallions uh, by a huge factor. Now that they've cut out the competition, supply and demand is high as hell for them. Their app is fantastically uh, useful and, and handy and a lot easier than picking up the phone to try to figure out what kind of cab you're going to use. So now they, they're going to start raising rates because it's so hard to maintain uh, independent contractors as, as well. So you're going to be seeing multiple increases in your cost of transportation, even if you're Ubering, lifting, or taking public transportation. An upturn in federal government spending was the second largest contributor to the acceleration of real GDP. So the first was fake money, and the second is federal government spending. Non-defense spending, intermediate goods and services purchased by the government is what they spent it on. This means Paycheck Protection Program loan, okay? On behalf of the federal government, a lot of it went to banks and hedge funds. A lot of banks and hedge funds stuck their hands out and said, give me a fucking loan. I need, I need hundreds of millions because my hedge fund is hurting. And they gave it to them. That added approximately 13 billion, which is 52.6 billion at an annual rate to non-defense services. And they dished out that money really quick. What can't they dish out though? The hundred percent of the money that they have for the eviction moratorium. Remember, they've only given out 6% of that. Uh, federal government purchases of COVID-19 vaccines for distribution to the public contribute to the upturn in non-defense goods. That's crazy. That's crazy. So you can see where they're spending all this money and where our GDP is. And the real fact of our economy is that it doesn't look good at all. Neither does our stock market. The upturn in state and local government spending reflected an upturn in consumption expenditures led by compensation of employees. So they're spending the mo more money than ever paying people and they're spending less money than ever in gross investments, office buildings, and other structures. Private inventory investment was led by a larger decrease in retail trade. Less warehouses are needed now because the retail trade is down. There's also a downturn in manufacturing. Within retail, the largest contributor was a larger decrease in inventory investment by motor vehicle dealers. There should be a lot more cars on these lots there's not enough chips, uh, computer chips to make because of precious metal shortages to make new cars. So because of hyperinflation and the supply and demand for used cars, those prices are through the roof as well. Within manufacturing, there were downturns in durable and non-durable goods, manufacturing inventory investment. So they're making and storing less vehicles and less food as well. Downturn in exports reflected downturns in both goods and services. So they're not, we're also not exporting as much, just for decreasing our GDP in a real way, not an artificial way. That was led by a deceleration in transport and a downturn in royalty fee, royalties and license fees. More downturns. Single family homes, investment slowed, largely reflecting the slowdown in new residential structures because they're not building new homes notably single family and a downturn in brokers commissions that's both real estate brokers and mortgage brokers they all have to take pay cuts in order to be able to keep this artificially inflated real estate and stock market flowing and that's still not good because new mortgage applications were down 27 percent in july compared to june that's just in july i don't know what the august numbers have, are going to look like yet and that's just the people who may have may or who may or may not have qualified. That's just the applications. I guarantee you some of those didn't actually qualify. Non-residential fixed investment slowed. So there's a slowdown in equipment. They're not making as much equipment as they usually are. So a lot of things that they were previously making, they're no longer requiring for 
construction, building, and many other non-residential, resi I'm sorry, that's the equipment. The non-residential fixed investments would be things like the warehousing and the distribution centers that are no longer required because of the downturn in manufacturing. You're gonna see a lot of empty buildings, both commercial and residential in the near future. Uh, there's a smaller decrease in investment in structures. So there was also a slight decrease in uh, commercial real estate, but that is still moving a little bit better than residential. Intellectual properties grew. It's good. People are making applications and creative things, and they're actually diversifying. So what that means is that people are diversifying. People like you and I are going out and doing other things that are not related directly to being employed in order to make money. That doesn't mean you're making great money, but it means that you're trying. So because, why? Because a lot of people like independent contractors don't qualify or have a, a lot of trouble qualifying for even the COVID uh, stimulus plans. The slowdown in equipment investment was more than accounted for by transportation equipment, less trucks on the road, less building equipment, et cetera. Imports have slowed. There's less manpower. There are supply chain issues all around the world there are, because of COVID. There are sick people all around the world and people that can't and don't want to work and also that are getting uh, paid by the government to sit at home. There are not people to man the ports and rail yards and steamship lines and all these other supply chain and trucking things and warehousing forklift drivers, office workers, all of these people that have to get things, goods from point A to point B, all the way down to the Amazon guy that drops things off or uh, anything in between. There's shortages nationwide and worldwide. And because of this, without getting into too much detail, imports have slowed. And on top of that, we're also not able to make as many cars globally. So we're not importing as many cars and uh, computer chips as we used to another contribution to the lack of real growth in the GDP, actually negative downturn. You know, they are taking a lot of our jobs overseas and I can't believe I'm actually saying that, but it's just the truth. A lot of things are being shipped uh, overseas to get made for a lot cheaper. And even the things that aren't like lumber are still being taken advantage of uh, by the lumber companies and other, just because they can and they know that there's a shortage that control supply and demand. There's reduced lending to home buyers. There's not many home buyers that can afford a home, that have the money to afford a home and the employment history to afford a home. Because even if they're doing well now, there's a good chance that they were recently let go from their position or that they were out of a job for a while. And as you know, if you haven't had a job, a steady job, W-2 for two years, it's gonna be extremely difficult to buy a home from any lender. You know, so there's a lot going on. All of this is based off COVID spending by the government in one way or another. It's the only thing keeping this market up for now. And the kicker is something's about to make it explode. See, now they're saying here on a new report from July 21st, which is the economic outlook report for 2021 to 2031. Does this ring a bell here? The one that they made for these 10 years that we just went through that are all completely off it's they're actually really realistically 20 uh 10 to 20 percent of what they actually projected we're going to be seeing the same things over here because that's what each report is this thing doesn't just go back a few years this thing goes back all the way to 1950. you can go ahead and keep, take a look at this for yourself but all these estimates for them are wrong now they're saying here that as the pandemic eases which it's not and demand for consumer services surges, which it hasn't because people have less money. So they're not gonna be going out for more takeout or more uh, transportation services because Uber and Lyft's getting more expensive and people don't have to go to work because a lot of people are unemployed. Consumer services are down. They're saying that if that happens, real GDP in CBOS projections grows by 7.4%. But they're also saying that it, and it will surpass its max potential maximum sustainable level by the end of the year. They are insinuating and directly stating that the GDP of this nation is going to grow by this much, but even still, it's going to surpass its maximum sustainable level and come down, they're insinuating a market crash. And that's based on the pandemic easing up and consumer services surging, neither of which are happening. Meanwhile, SIBO claims that unemployment is going to decrease. Yeah, that's what they say. They also claim that the 10-year Treasury is going to rise in 2025 to 2.7%. But we know that that's at under one and a quarter right now. 
Taking a look at the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, nine states have an unemployment rate of over 7% and several states as high as 7.9%. That's insane. And the national average is 5.9, with some states that have very low population having a low unemployment rate, naturally. But places like California and Texas, where they have the most population, are the ones that have the highest unemployment rates. The debt ceiling dilemma. You know, there was a two-year deal uh, that had our debt ceiling raised. And that lapsed on July 31st of 2021 because uh, Congress and President Biden uh, couldn't give the United States Treasury, Janet Yellen, more authority to move forward because of their fighting about an infrastructure bill. They've been fighting about it for months and they touted it as great news that they sent, passed it through the the Senator or the House, wherever the hell they sent it to for approval. I think it was a committee. Uh, They just basically took a, a pile of shit, stuffed it in a gift box and wrapped a bow on it. And they're saying, here you go to these congressmen who are gonna argue about this relentlessly. Because there are things in there regarding crypto and others, other items that are going to destroy American freedoms. Things are not going to be good in this bill, and they're going to make it look like they're saving our asses when they're not. They're not going to do America any favors with this bill. The Treasury Department will now begin talking, taking what it refers to as extraordinary measures to prevent from defaulting on its debt. Pensions and 401ks and doctors and hospitals and schools are not gonna get paid. Maybe not this week, maybe not next week, maybe not for a month or a year or two. It's happened before and it's gonna happen again. Now, I'm not saying they're not gonna get paid ever, but it's gonna get delayed significantly. Republican leaders have told Democrats that there can be no bipartisan debt ceiling agreement without a slate of debt reduction measures targeting the roughly $28 trillion national debt. This is, again, more factual information that you will see rear its ugly head in the near future. Several lawmakers have floated a deal similar to the 2011, wink, wink, Budget Control Act, sound like the debt ceiling crisis then, and which ended a debt ceiling standoff shortly before the U.S. suffered its first ever credit downgrade. However, what did happen in 2011? Let's find out. Democrats argue that tr- tying a debt ceiling increase to a controversial, controversial legislation is akin to holding the financial system hostage. What does that mean? It means that Democrats know that all 50 of them are not going to agree. So they're trying to push the blame back on these Republicans. I could care care which party's doing what. They're trying to push the blame back, saying that you Republicans, you have to come along with this because we know that we're not going to get all 50 of our side to agree on this. In June, SIBO had estimated that Congress had until October or November before the Treasury Department exhausts extraordinary measures. That was back in June. They They said October or November. But the most recent report from July 24, 21st says, and they have warned, uh, quote unquote, for, uh, warned that the U.S. could be on the verge of default soon after lawmakers return. That is a statement directly from Janet Yellen uh, from a planned summer recess in September. That's September 20th. That's coming up really quickly. All this time from August, all this white means that they're off and they don't come back together both the House and Senate, to discuss this until September 20th. So they've only got the, from the 20th through the 24th and the 27th through the, the 30th. So they've essentially got five, four uh, business days here, total of nine business days to discuss it before the government shutdown on October 1st, because that's the beginning of the next fiscal quarter. And the fiscal year, I meant to say. It's the beginning of the new fiscal year, I believe. So that's really bad because if, they don't come to an agreement before this date. The government will shut down at 12 a.m. sharp Eastern time, October 1st. This is directly from the congressional calendar. Yellen is telling us that the U.S. could be on the verge of default soon after they return. The timing and size of revenue collections and outlays over the coming months could differ noticeably from SIBO projections. This was from SIBO, excuse me. The timing and size of revenue collections could and outlays over the coming months could differ noticeably from SIBO's projections. Therefore, the extraordinary measures could be exhausted and Treasury could run out of cash either earlier or later than they project. They're literally saying we have no fucking idea. We're just throwing numbers out there and we were wrong three months ago. Yellen has also said, Uncertainty driven by the coronavirus pandemic and federal government's fiscal response has made it harder to pin down exactly how long the U.S. could avoid a default. Again, 
she's telling you it could happen well before. She already said that it could happen after they come back in September, but now she's telling us that it's uns- that the uncertainty driven by the pandemic and the response makes it hard to pin down. So it could happen sooner. Got to read between the lines and use common sense. See, this was her quote as well. Quote, quote, quote. I just moved them around because the way the mainstream media project pr- makes them look is nothing the way that they actually say them. They separate everything in these articles to try to to turn a negative into a positive. Only 6% of all money provided by the government rent relief has been sent out to Americans. Okay, It's already moving at a snail's pace. How long before these landlords and homeowners really go bankrupt? Think about it. Biden made a national statement about the CDC uh, extending the moratorium. But again, that's illegal and unconstitutional. They're not a regulatory body. Uh, Story time. Uh, I bought my house in January of 2021. Uh, I looked at with my family and had a bidding war uh, on literally four houses. We looked at more than that, but we had a bidding war on four houses. This home, we actually had to go through with a friend, buy it on the pre-market uh, when it wasn't listed on the MLS, and we got it for asking price. I was ecstatic, and I am ecstatic with my purchase. However, uh, I went to my local bank uh, to open uh, new accounts recently. It was a couple of weeks ago. I was on 8-4. Uh, they offered me a line of credit for 50 grand. I didn't have to fill out any additional paperwork. All I had to do was sign. And they gave it to me like that. I spent one and a half hours talking to the bank manager and the head banker. And they told me that literally the entire housing market changed at the beginning of August. That there was almost zero showings that they knew of in town that weekend, the, the first weekend in August. And I realized that at that moment, uh, there's a house, kitty corner to mine, that's been for sale for at this point, almost four months. Uh, The first weekend, there was dozens of cars that came to see it. And each weekend, progressively less. Uh, A few weeks ago, I saw one family see the house. And in the last, since the fourth, and I work from home most days, since the fourth, I've only seen one family see this damn house. It's still sitting. And it's almost exactly the same as mine, and it's priced cheaper. Moving on. The United States Senate passed the infrastructure bill on August 10th. Again, polishing a turd that's going to get kicked around by Congress when they return on September 20th. All 50 Democrats need to agree because the Republicans are definitely going to oppose. The end of the fiscal year is the last day of September, and this could cause a possible government shutdown as of 12 a.m. Eastern on October 1st. Congressional calendar right there. CDC information links for everybody right there. I believe that our our GDP is a complete farce. And these reports are literally telling us this. It's held up by stimulus payments and government COVID spending, repurchase and reverse repurchase agreements of treasury bills to the tune of over a trillion dollars a day. We're now averaging 1.1 to 1.2 trillion dollars every damn day. We haven't seen anything like this in history. Even in 2008, when the reverse repurchase spiked, that spiked minimally compared to what we're looking at now. Because everything from 2008 has been kicked down infinitely, infinitely. And here we are to take a look at what happened then. What did we see in 2008? They were putting in 7 billion, 25 billion. Right here, the September 29th. September 29th was the stock market crash. And in those dates, we had right around $25 billion in reverse repurchase. Let's move that on and take a look at the 2011 and 2013 debt ceiling crises. In 2008, we had a uh, real estate crisis. So we're going to move right on over to 2011 and take a look at that because you need to see this. And they're not actually, they didn't use it in 2011. But when did they use it? 2013, the debt ceiling crisis. September 23rd, 24th. They had none, and that's, I'm sorry, before that, but then that, those dates, they came up to 11.8 billion. And then on October, September 30th, they went up to 58 billion, the day before the October 1st government shutdown. And we all know that the stock market took a big hit, and I'll get into those numbers in a little bit. And then it continued to rise, continued to rise. December 31st of that year, they had to balance the books because it was the end of the year, the end of the fiscal quarter. And they had so much, so much BS going on that they had to pump money into the RRP to balance their books. What do we see here? 2018, stock market crashes. 
gigantic spikes and run-ups. 2020, stock market crash, huge spike up and run-up. Where, where is that at? I can't get to the top. And where are we now? Look at that. 1.11 trillion. Let's include 2008 so you can see how big of a difference this is. That's 08 right there, 25 billion. And that's where we're at now because they've been kicking the can on funds that have been shorts that have not been covered, not been closed out, naked shorts, synthetic shares, failures to deliver, shorts marked as long, which means they're cooking the books. They're making their asset uh, liabilities appear to be assets. And it's not true. Their liabilities are increasing by the tens of trillions every month. And their assets are only increasing by the hundreds of billions. And those numbers are skewed already because we know they're cooking the books when they mark these shorts as long. This, this, this shit just pisses me off beyond belief. The bubble from the stimulus has already been popped. All right. It's a short matter of time before this shit destroys our stock market and our fucking economy. It's not going to be a little stock market correction of 10% like Bank of America is trying to tell people and hedge funds are trying to tell people to keep their money in the market. I don't know what the right answer is for everybody else, but I know that AMC and GME are the right answer for me and a lot of other 5 million people that are invested in. Why? Because there are facts and figures and that have been shown that these funds have been manipulated and shorted 10 times over, 20 times over the actual existing shares in the form of naked shorts, synthetic shares, and failures to deliver because they can't come up with these shares. And when they do, they're synthetic. They've been pushing this down the line for many, many years. Some people don't think that's the case, but I guarantee you it'll come out when this is over. This is not financial advice. This is just my opinion. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm just a business owner. I'm an American trying to get ahead, and I know better I know, I know a good thing when I see it. I've never seen something like this in the stock market. And I've never seen banks be over leveraged to the tune of $189 trillion, which is five times the entire world's GDP, five times the world's GDP. That's what they owe in these liabilities derivatives. And that doesn't include these naked shorts, Mark, these naked shorts. That doesn't include synthetic shares. That doesn't include the shorts marked as long. This is going to be nasty. In reality, they owe five to 10 times the amount or more or more. So what are we looking at? 10, 20 times the world GDP owed by these banks. And the top four banks own 90% of those unrealized losses. It's unsustainable. And it's only a matter of days or weeks, maybe days in my opinion, before we start to see massive drops in certain stocks and in the NASDAQ, the SPY, I'm sorry, the NASDAQ, the S&P, the Dow, and everything else. But the only things that are going to jump and go through with the roof are shorts. And these companies like GME and AMC, and even Tesla, that have been shorted so much, and so many times illegally, more so than they actually shares exist, that when those shares get to be bought back, because the other rest of the market is tanking, and banks are losing their margin, position are not able to maintain their margin position because their liquidity is being drained by losing assets invested in, other, in, the, in the rest of the stock market. There are going to be margin calls coming for days, for weeks, for days and weeks. And it, they might be a lot of them in one day. And we're going to see massive, massive spikes in prices on these to the, to, to the tune of, you know, maybe three, four, five, six figures per share, per share. And I know that sounds insane, but because it is insane, but the, the math adds up. <laughs> the last two times the debt ceiling crisis occurred in 11 and 13, rating agencies gave, they gave us downgrades to American debt. In October, they, rate, gave, they moved us down to rating watch negative. And in October 17, two days later, the gone global credit rating downgraded the United States from A to an A minus and maintained the negative outlook on our credit. That destroyed our market, all right? Look, in, while law, lawmakers in Obama administration came to an agreement on the debt ceiling, sound familiar? From September 19th to October 9th, the S&P 500 
law and the spy law i'm sorry lost the s p 500 moved below 50-day moving average and the spy lost 5.2 percent in 2013 while lawmakers in the obama administration came to an agreement from september 19th to october 9th the s p 500 moved below the below the 50-day moving average and the spy lost over five percent all right on august 9th of 2011 when the, the dow jones plunged 634 points the world lost $2.5 trillion in global equities. A few weeks ago in July, there was an 800 point drop in the Dow. And banks and the Fed bought it right back up because the Fed doesn't care. They printed so much money that they're artificially propping up the stock market. They've got a quid pro quo going on. The, the, the hedge funds and banks can use the RRP. Sorry, not hedge funds. The banks can use the RRP when they have so much money in their accounts and they can maintain their margin positions. And then the Fed can just print them more money and they need to burn money anyway. So they can have the, the, these banks throw some of it into the, the, the stock market to boost it back up artificially to keep it at all time high levels. Because if they don't, they know investors are going to sell off immediately. The S&P 500 lost 6.7% and fell to its lowest level in September. And all 500 stocks fell for the first time since 96 when they started tracking it. And in my opinion, opinion for the first time ever, most likely. Now we have the most recent report from the Federal Reserve, H8, Assets and Liabilities of Commercial Banks, was released August 20th, just yesterday, today's Saturday, August 21st for me, uh, but if you're watching this, it doesn't matter, these reports are released every Friday, and this is interesting, check it out. What do we have? Increase in bank credit, increase in securities in bank credit. An increase in mortgage-backed securities week over week of that's uh this is expressed in billions of dollars so this would be three to 30 billion right there i think, believe it's three billion in one week an increase in mortgage-backed securities and about seven billion in one week other securities slightly up as well You know, well, let's move on down right here real quick. Actually, before we do, let's take a look at residential real estate loans. Where were we July of 2020? Even during COVID, there was at 2.2 trillion for table two out of 11 tables. 2.2 trillion in residential real estate loans. What are we looking at now? 2.296. Now we're looking at 2.22, August 11th, which is down from August 4th, which is down from July 20th, 28th, and slightly up from the 21st. But either way, if you look at August of 221, that's a, a $20 billion difference from June through July on this one table alone in residential real estate, residential real estate loans. Okay, that's a big drop because you got to add up all these tables and all these other banks together. Cash assets higher than ever. Why? Artificial money printing. And it's slipping out in the economy. The government can't keep up with it. It's in the it's in the market. The banks are putting it in the RRP so that they can maintain their margin position and their liquidity because every day they have to continue to short the hedge funds and banks that are so far into these liabilities may have to continue to short the stocks because when they don't and the price gets a little too high, it's going to cause a domino effect where one hedge fund and the next and the next all have to start buying back. It's going to be beautiful, beautiful. Deposits for banks are liabilities because they don't keep that money in a vault. They put it in the stock market. They put it in these shitty mortgage-backed securities, credit default swaps, shitty tranches of garbage, and, and liabilities out the ass. Look at what we're looking at now. $19.8 trillion August 11th. And in July, we were at 19.69. You know, let's look at last last year, 18.1 trillion. 
So we, they've, their liabilities, their losses, their unrealized losses have increased for the banks that are, that are in this particular table by this much money. They have increased by $1.7 trillion in one year on this table. Now, what about their assets? That's their losses. How about the resident residuals? Their assets minus liabilities, uh, 2.058 tr uh, trillion compared to 1.952. Well, this went up by 1.8 trillion. How much did this change? Man, that barely changed at all. Their, their residual assets only changed by 100 billion compared to 1.8 trillion. Wow, that's bad. <clears throat> Moving on. You know what? Let's not let's not go too far into this one. So we've got a lot to cover. Let's just keep going. I don't know how long this video is going to be. Again, I apologize. I'm not purposely making long videos, but this is not easy concept. There's no TLDR for this shit. All right. Naked and synthetic shorts are not reported on the numbers we just looked at, people. Did you get that? These numbers are way worse. This is crazy. And there's going to be some squeeze worth, whether it's through an NFT dividend or a debt ceiling crisis or a real estate market uh, collapse or something else, war with China or Kabul or uh, anywhere else and that might, where this might happen. And then we've got hyperinflation setting in that we haven't seen. We haven't seen these levels of inflation since 2008. More coincidences, huh? We just talked about this, but just table two from a couple of weeks ago, that was showing an increase in $15.6 trillion in unrealized uh, losses in one year. Crazy, right? If I misspoke earlier about that, this is the actual number. I went ahead and did the math. You can go ahead and do it yourself as well. But at, during this point, I did it and it was $15.6 trillion in one year increase on table two of 11 for the unrealized losses in all of these combined. Are they spending this money in dark pools? 61.8% of all their volume is being traded on dark pools. This is nuts. Man, I need to smoke another blunt. This is fucking aggravating. Take a look at the holding companies. What's a holding company? Oxford Dictionary says it's a company created to buy and possess the shares of other companies, which it then controls. Holding companies, credit default swaps year over year are up 1600%. Wow. What about the banks? Those things are also up 3,400%. So what happens when you add up 3,400 and 1,600? You come up with a 5,000% increase. A 5,000% increase on credit default swaps and mortgage-backed securities and shit. Tapering is not going to work. Inflation is not transitory. There's a reason they're telling us they're using all these fancy words. They're trading off multiple swaps here between themselves in order to reduce their overall margin requirements and they're making it look like they have assets that they really don't it looks pretty fucking negative to me this is the when they mark these shorts as long they're literally cooking the books and not even taking that into consideration again the, all this orange bar out of this entire bar which is 190 trillion dollars unrealized losses is owned by is owed by just these top four banks Calculations for all of these. What do we have that's down? Loans and bank credit, commercial industrial loans are down, residential estate, all sorts of residential loans are down. Commercial real estate loans, industrial loans. What's up? Farmland, multifamily properties, non-farm residential properties, and consumer loans. Total federal funds sold in reverse. Doesn't mean shit because it's just one table out of all of them combined. We know the RRP is going up. We've seen the Federal Reserve uh information and the total assets increased ever so slightly you know many americans are, are going to lose their homes their businesses uh savings 401k a lot more than previously in 2008 it's going to get disgusting on this on the streets and i know we're already seeing it just take a look in your own neighborhood and decide for yourself what you think's going on go ahead and follow these reports if you'd like there are uh, a lot of ways to access them on twitter and youtube as well as just google searching them but i've got links for you on all these reports uh directly in reddit as well as twitter youtube you can go anywhere you want look up boss blunts or marcel klinovic i also posted them on linkedin and facebook 
put them everywhere. People need to know this stuff. Uh, could this really lead to the collapse of the dollar? It's probably not the entire collapse of the dollar, I think, because the U.S. government wants to maintain its power. But it's definitely going to take a hit, as are the entirety of the rest of global equities. Crypto is going to get heavily regulated with this infrastructure bill in the United States. The new Chinese digital yuan has been proposed as of May of this year. It's going to use blockchain. They're using their own government regulated crypto. And I think America is trying to get on board with that as well, with an American regulated crypto. It's, it's a race. China's economy took a major hit in 2020 and in 2021, whereas America managed to print, print its way almost artificially into further bull market and extending it a little bit further. Uh, but that's not going to last any longer. And there are many reasons that you can probably see are culminating altogether to where even if one or two of these subside, the rest of them are still compiling and compacting. And then we've got other issues globally, like global warming and global currents that are starting to completely fail and disappear because of the Arctic ice sheet in uh, the North Antarctic melting and releasing so much fresh water into the oceans that global currents are literally dissipating and dissolving. So sustainable fishing and farming and wildlife worldwide is going to take a hit. It can cause famine and starvation because we've already got supply chain issues and fishing shortages. What's going to happen when some of these global currents that traverse thousands and thousands of miles that lots of creatures use to traverse the ocean are no longer there? It's going to kill a vast majority of ocean life and possibly more. I don't know what's going to happen, but if you find any of this valuable, please share it because people need to know what the hell's going on. Uh, Liquidity is going to dry up. These market makers, broker dealers, uh, prime brokers, hedge funds, and banks are not going to be able to cover all these liabilities. The DTCC, the NSCC, SEC, and FINRA and have been enacting hundreds of new filings since Gary Gensler and it became the head of the SEC in the beginning of 2021. Gurbir Gruwal came on to the SEC as the head prosecutor. He is a very skilled prosecutor that was the head prosecutor for the state of New Jersey. And he is a absolute professional and man killer when it comes to taking white collar criminals down. I'm looking forward to see what these guys are going to do. But they're not doing it because you and I want them to. They're doing it because if they don't all of their insurance policies are going to get eaten up. They've got a $100 trillion insurance policy, but it's not enough. You can see what these derivatives are. They're a lot more than $100 trillion. So when you take everything that the banks have, everything that all these guys have, and you add it up, it doesn't equal five times the world's GDP plus the naked short synthetic shares, FTDs, and shorts marked as long that have to be covered and closed out. This is a fucking crisis. mother of all short squeezes is imminent. There's no going back. Did a few videos about this already with Jackson Hunter. Uh, we did a few interviews, we did a Q&A session. We did, did an inter, uh, interview with this with Dave's Daily Trades. Please check them out. They're both wonderful individuals. Uh, they gave me a platform to start explaining what is going on with these reports because I just recently joined Twitter and YouTube uh, a few months ago, simply because this needs to be talked about. And I don't see anybody talking about this. Everybody reads these reports. The federal government, the Congress, the Senate, they all know what's happening. Your local banker, the managing banker, they all know what's happening. And none of them are gonna tell you, none of them. You ask them about the RRP, they go, oh yeah, we just put it in there so we, so we can you know, pull it out the next night and not lose any money. That's not the real reason why they need it. It's one of them, but not the only reason. Think about it with some common sense and just figure it out for yourself because it doesn't take a lot. It doesn't take a lot of stretching here. You don't have to really reach to come up with conclusion. And what's that conclusion? That they have been pushing this down the line since 2008. 
it started before then that we saw a market crash then we saw it in 11 13 18 20 and we're gonna see it worse than we have ever seen it in any of any of our lifetimes it's gonna be the great depression 2.0 and i'm not a doom and gloom kind of guy this scares the shit out of me to be discussing but someone's got to talk about it and i hope to god i'm wrong but read the reports for yourself do your own due diligence figure out what's going on with these stocks I don't have to tell you what the government's saying if you open your eyes and read them but a lot of people aren't doing it these reports are released in complete science silence CNBC isn't showing you these documents that are 50 pages long explaining to you everything that's going on in this country but I am and other other youtubers are why because we're not paid by the mainstream media I'm not putting ads on these videos. I'm not monetizing these videos. I could give a shit if this makes me a dime. I don't want to make any money off this.